Okay, so I am just going to finish up talking about these last few slides with the political geography unit um, prior to your test. And where we left off, I was talking about the post-Cold War era. So um, the changing relationships that existed in the world after the Cold War are something that has been very influential today in the modern world. So for example, after the Cold War with the breakup of the Soviet Union, a lot of those countries, especially countries in parts of the world that had at one time been controlled by the former Soviet Union, begin to sort of break apart. And the old alliance system of the Cold War, um, it was extremely important for nations like the United States, those superpowers, to shore up their relationships with various nations. Well, as these nations start breaking up, it becomes initially kind of unclear who we have relationships with and who we don't. Um, smaller regions became dominated by conflict. So on this slide, you see the Balkans, the Caucasus region, Central Asia. Those regions all really become very much dominated by um, conflict. Um, but add to this, and you can't, you know, you can't get away from adding to this picture the fact that at the same time, we're really looking at um, the post-colonial era as well. The colonial era had really come to an end in the 1960s, late 60s, maybe even into the 70s. You could still, um, you could still say there was some um, portions of the colonial era that were still going on. But essentially, by the end of the 20th century, the colonial era has also come to an end. So here is the collision that you have of these two major systems, the Cold War system, where you had the Soviet Union and the United States as superpowers in sort of relative control over both hemispheres and regions within those different hemispheres. And then you had the colonial era in which these nations had, for the purposes of colonialism, been undermined. Their internal government structures had been eliminated. Internal um, ethnic conflicts had been heightened for the advantage of the colonizer, Rwanda being a great example, where the Rwandan um, tribes, the Hutu and the Tutsi, who become the two large tribes at the end of the colonial era, during colonialism, um, the Belgians had taken advantage of the rivalries that existed between tribes within Rwanda, and when they left, they left all of these bitternesses that existed then between these tribal groups. So we have these two major things occurring, the end of the Cold War, the end of the colonial era, and it leads to a very unstable world. The 1990s, there were lots of small regional conflicts that were brewing and going on. The most well-known of those was probably the conflict in the Balkans. So we have ethnic cleansing going on in places um, uh, like the Balkan region, Serbia, the former Yugoslavia, where we have different ethnic groups that are vying for control and sovereignty. And that's the problem with the process of balkanization when you have these country or these ethnic groups that have been so sort of strongly controlled by one superpower or the other, and then suddenly the lid is taken off, those conflicts begin to emerge. So these weak central governments of the colonial, uh, the colonialists, uh, held territories also become a problem because whenever you have a weak central government, there is the chance that you'll have um, groups that will emerge that will become extremist groups or dangerous groups. Afghanistan is a great example of this. In the post-Cold War era, we had the United States, of course, funding the Taliban with enormous amounts of American support, money, training, and those kinds of things. And into this sort of post-Cold War world, once the United States walked away and was like, all right, well, the Soviets aren't there anymore, so we don't have to worry about you, comes this really extremist government, this government, as we talked about in class, that was extremely brutal, brutal not just to women but also to men, and imposed this fundamentalist-style Islamic regime that became um, one of the most um, brutal regimes in the world. And this is created because of those two forces. So these Western powers, these, you know, sort of uh, colonial powers, as well as these superpowers of the U.S. and the Soviet Union, cannot really escape a lot of their culpability in the sort of emerging modern world as we come into the end of the 1990s. The United States, one of the things that the U.S. did in this sort of chaotic time when all this change was going on was the United States began to make alliances and to shore up their relationships with different um, leaders around the world that they felt they could maintain um, diplomatic relationships with. In spite of the fact that some of these individuals that they may have been creating these relationships with may or may not have been people who were supported by the people within that country. A really good example of that is Egypt. 
the United States um, was extremely uh, close friends with the former Egyptian regime. As a matter of fact, Mubarak, who was the leader of Egypt until um, the revolution that happened just a couple of years ago during the Arab Spring, Mubarak was one of the most brutal dictators in the world. Um, he did not allow dissent. Um, elections, like the electoral process in Egypt, was really just kind of a joke. It wasn't true. Their people weren't really allowed to run against Mubarak. So the United States existing in this world makes friends with Mubarak because what we don't want is we don't want all the bad guys that Mubarak has in jail. And he had tens of thousands of extremists who were in his jails, people who were um, uh, had sort of cut their teeth in the Palestinian movement and some of whom had very anti-American feelings because of America's support to Israel. Um, a lot of those people were in Egyptian jails. And the United States uh, Central Intelligence Agency and, you know, um, security institutions in the United States were very concerned about some of those people in those jails in Egypt. And so in order to ensure that Mubarak would keep those people in jail and that he would maintain a good relationship with the United States and not, you know, become friendly with people that we didn't agree with or who we didn't like, um, the United States really reached out to Mubarak, gave him, in fact, millions of dollars. During the Cold War and the post-Cold War era, Mubarak was the second largest recipient of um, American foreign aid, the, the, the Egyptians were. The, the Israelis were first, and um, uh, the Egyptians were second in terms of like military aid and assistance. And so you can see how much support we gave to countries like Egypt. So another example of that is Iraq. The United States government was very friendly with Saddam Hussein for a number of years, despite the fact that Saddam Hussein is himself a Sunni. And as a Sunni, he was a minority in Iraq. The majority of Iraqis are Shiite. And so here is Saddam Hussein ruling as a Sunni in a majority Shiite country. He's not been elected. He is, in fact, a dictator. He has killed, after the Gulf War, um, and at that point, we weren't friends with Hussein. But prior to the Gulf War, we had had, in the 1980s, a friendly relationship with him. But Hussein had killed thousands and thousands of his own people. Again, um, there is no democratic process to speak of. Now, imagine that you are a young man or woman growing up in one of these countries. And you're living in this extremely oppressive country that is um, ruled by an individual who is supported by the United States. Well we begin to get a picture of a generation of, um, of um, international, like Arabs, people living in the Middle East, um, who are extremely angry. Angry not just because of the United States support of Israel, which is one of the, the major reasons that Al-Qaeda um, gave for their attacks on September 11th, but also one of the things that they were extremely angry about was the United States' continued support of dictators around the world. Because if you're an Egyptian living in Egypt and your father has been in prison in Egypt without a trial, without any conviction for 10 years, the rage, you can imagine, really builds up inside of you. And this generation of young Arabs who grew up in a world where the U.S. supported um, these dictators, not just in uh, Iraq, not just in Egypt, but also in Saudi Arabia. Um, there are lots of um, Arabs, especially fundamentalists, who feel very strongly that the current regime in um, Saudi Arabia is uh, should be overthrown and toppled. But keep in mind, the United States has a super close relationship with Saudi Arabia, the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. If you think about it, and, and as I think about it, I can sort of understand the frustration because from an outsider's perspective, it looks extremely hypocritical for the United States to sort of wave its flag of democracy and tout ourselves as the greatest democracy in the world, and yet for our own political, geographical security needs, we are willing to trade other people's freedom, essentially, by supporting dictators and kings like in Saudi Arabia and Iraq and even in countries like Syria for um, our own security. So we have traded their freedom, essentially, for our security. That's how a lot of people in the Arab world see it. So when you ask yourself, how did we get to a place where this organization, Al-Qaeda, was able to establish this massive global network um, to sort of bring people from various regions within Central Asia, within Europe, within North Africa, to kind of create this um, um, 
web of anti-American terrorist uh, network, well, it makes sense how they could recruit young men and women um, to this organization when you consider how the United States, excuse me, how the United States actions in the post-colonial and the post-Cold War, War world were so heavily dominated by our sort of geopolitical, like, um, like wrangling. I mean, we were setting up the board. If you've ever played the game Risk, you know, you set the board up strategically so that it works for you. And that's how the United States played the globe um, for the entire 20th century and even into the first part of the 21st century because it was to our political and, frankly, economic advantage. But in a globalized world the way that we are today, with things changing so dramatically, it becomes more important that the United States look at not just our alliances with nations or our alliances with leaders, but right now the United States government has to take very special and pay very special attention to what are the groups within those nations who are existing and representing factions that may or may not be allied with Al-Qaeda or that may themselves simply um, oppose some of the uh, behavior and decisions that the American government has made um, over the last few years and potentially into the future. So, so the question then is why has terrorism increased? And it increases as this sort of link with nationalism becomes less important because these groups like Al-Qaeda are not linked so much with nationalism. In the old world, in the alliance system, it was all about nationalism. It was whose nation you were connected to. Were you an Austrian or were you a Guatemalan or like what nation were you connected to? And in the modern world, um, our violence, so it says here, I know it's pretty small so you might not be able to see it, so it says a systematic terrorism as it's defined is a systematic use of violence to intimidate a population or coerce a government. And so this coercion of governments and this intimidation practice is something that's used regularly within countries to sort of shape the geopolitics of different regions for the purpose of groups within those countries gaining a political economic um, advantage. So um, terrorists do all kinds of things from bombing and use of um, fear tactics, scare tactics, but they almost exclusively use those tactics against civilian populations. And that's another part of this sort of new world, this new way of seeing how um, war is fought and how sort of we came to this sort of post 9-11 reality. Um, to speak specifically of um, September 11th is something a lot of Americans wonder about. Like, how did, why did September 11th happen? And it's not a simple answer. Um, it's not because Osama bin Laden was a bad man, and that's why it happened. I mean, that's a component. So Osama bin Laden absolutely plays an enormous role in coordinating and organizing. But so, too, did some of the leaders that had, going all the way back to our what I said about Egypt, some of the leaders of Al-Qaeda actually originally organized themselves, get this, within the prisons of Egypt. So the second in command at Al-Qaeda was actually a man who had um, recruited a number of people into the Al-Qaeda network while he was in prison. And once he was released from prison in Egypt, um, he then joined Osama bin Laden in Afghanistan and um, they really built this international network. And that network was very focused on, their, Al Qaeda is very focused on an anti-American agenda. Not all terrorist groups are focused on an anti-American agenda, but Al Qaeda itself is. And they have sort of made the largest, the largest noise essentially um, globally uh, in the last decade or so. So, um, the, these attacks were organized in, by people within Afghanistan, this territory, and some of those organizers had been trained by the U.S. Um, while they were fighting uh, with the Mujahideen um, and sort of showing us how that sort of Cold War behavior led us to this position. Because at that time, we weren't spending as much time focused on some of these internal discussions and debates and, and crises, but rather we had our eyes so focused on the sort of anti-Soviet mission that... Um, it, it sort of paved the way for this new world. Okay, so um, that's where I'm going to stop, and we will pick up um, after the break talking about development, but also we'll spend a little bit of time talking, um, continuing talking about these subjects after the exam. So good luck on your unit um, for exam, and let me know if you need any help. Okay, thanks.